My name's Jeremy Tiang. I'm the Asia Literary Editor here at the workshop. Welcome to Speaking Truth to Power, Confronting Authoritarian Regimes. How is resistance possible when reality itself is obscured? In an era of fake news and more facts than anyone could hope to grasp, authoritarians rely on this uncertainty to consolidate their hold on power. Legendary journalist Raisa Robles joins us from the Philippines to share her new work, Marcos Martial Law, Never Again, which reappraises the era of Marcos and applies its lessons to what is unfolding today. Communication specialist for human rights advocacy and journalist Rad Rahman will share her research on state repression in Bangladesh from the Rohingya refugees fleeing attacks in Myanmar to the persecution of LGBTQ Bangladeshis. And writer and translator Tenzin Deki will discuss writing and translating work about Tibetans navigating the ongoing Chinese occupation. To start off with, we're going to have a reading from Tenzin Deki, the editor of Old Demons, New Deities, 21 short stories from Tibet, published by OR Books, and in bookstores December 5th, or if you can't wait, at the back tonight with a special member's discount. If you're not a member, we can fix that too. <laughs> there will also be a launch at the Strand Bookstore on the 5th of December, which we encourage you to attend. Old Demons, New Deities is the first English language anthology of contemporary Tibetan fiction available in the West. This book collects 21 short stories by 16 writers in Tibet and the diaspora who write in Tibetan, English, and Chinese, creating a wide-ranging portrait of Tibetan writers who navigate occupation and exile. Dickie's own writing has been published in Indian literature, Apogee Journal, Tibetan Review, Himal South Asian, and Cultural Anthropology. A 2014-15 Fellow of the American Literary Translators Association, she holds an MFA from Columbia University and a BA from Harvard University. She's an editor at treasuryoflives.org, a biographical encyclopedia of significant figures from Tibet, Inner Asia, and the Himalaya region. Everyone, please welcome Tenzin Dickey. Hi. I'm reading from the introduction to Old Demon's New Deities. I was around 12 when I saw my first Tibetan film. I had no idea what I was seeing. This was at my Tibetan boarding school in Dharamsala, the capital of Tibet in exile. One night, our usual evening study session was canceled. The school monitors herded us into the main hall. A white sheet hung on stage, and we watched the images projected onto it. A Tibetan man wearing army fatigues gets off a bus. With his crew cut and military physique, he is clearly a soldier in the Tibetan unit of the Indian Army, a soldier retired and returning home to his Tibetan settlement in the Indian South. Carrying an oversized duffel bag, and with a stereo blaring Bollywood music on his shoulder, he saunters into the alleys of the settlement as kids watch him admiringly. He learns English from a Tibetan woman in a scene that causes the hall to ring with delighted laughter, as my classmates and I see mirrored on the screen our own struggles with foreign languages, Hindi and English. She tells him he's an idiot, and he annoys her by saying things like, if P-U-T is put, then why isn't C-U-T kut? At the end of half an hour, the man and the woman run into the fields and chase each other around a tree in the leitmotif of all Hindi filmy Prem Kahania. I watched the whole thing, entranced and bewildered. It was only at the very end of the half hour when the couple circled the tree in the recurring Indian cinematic trope of romantic love that I finally realized with a jolt what I was watching. This was a Tibetan film, a Tibetan romantic comedy I had never seen a Tibetan film before. There were none. There were no Tibetan films, no Tibetan short stories, no Tibetan novels. Juno Diaz says, you know how vampires have no reflections in the mirror. If you want to make a human being a monster, deny them at the cultural level 
any reflection of themselves. We grew up, those of us who grew up in exile, but also those of us who grew up in Tibet, all of us, without reflections. Why was that? Why did we grow up as, to use Edwige Dantikat's phrase, literary orphans? The arrival of modern Tibetan literature as we know it is crystallized in the towering tragic figure of Thundub Gyal in the 1980s. But before Thundub Gyal, there was Gendon Chopel, Tibet's first great modernist, an early 20th century poet, writer, artist, and historian. A one-time monk scholar who left the monastery behind for a secular life, he traveled widely both on the Tibetan plateau and in the Indian subcontinent and bridged the gap between 19th and 20th century Tibet, between Tibet and the outside world. His friend and contemporary was Babu Tharchin, a Christian of Tibetan descent from the Kinnor region of northern India and publisher of the first ever Tibetan language newspaper, Mirror of the World. Tarjan operated out of Kalimpong in India, the cosmopolitan hill station known as the Paris of the East, and a hub for the international Tibetan elite, and sent his newspapers into Tibet on the backs of yaks. Around this time, formal schools for lay students were established for the first time in Lhasa and elsewhere in Tibet. The stage was finally set for an organic evolution of Tibetan literary arts, but it was not to be. Instead of continuity and evolution, there was rupture. First, a backlash by the conservative and monastic elements of Tibetan society, leading to a closing of the Tibetan schools, followed by foreign invasion. Mao sent his army into Tibet in 1949. By 1959, the brutal Chinese military takeover was complete, and Tibetan society was upended. The young Dalai Lama escaped into exile in India, followed by tens of thousands of Tibetans. My family on both sides left Tibet when the Chinese came and followed the Dalai Lama into exile. I was born and raised in one of the Tibetan refugee settlements of North India. As a function of growing up in Tibet in India, a young society, an exile community trying to reroot itself in foreign soil, we were cut off from our historical past, from our historical literature and culture. Of course, for Tibetans growing up on the other side of the mountains, this break from history was imposed by the Chinese state. This separation from our literary past was compounded by the fact that modern Tibetan literature was still in its infancy. Thus, on both sides of the Himalayas, we grew up orphaned from our literature. We were missing the point of departure, the runway from which to lift off. For a young reader, this meant a peculiar kind of abandonment and isolation the lack of one's reflection in the surfaces and the depths around oneself, an insular isolation that makes itself known only when something finally pierces it. For me, that moment was when I read Tenzin Sundu's beautiful poem, When It Rains in Dharamsala. I read it, electrified, and began to write a poem. It was not just that I knew the rain in Dharamsala, it was that I knew Sundu, and he was like me, I had always been a reader, but that was the first time I thought that perhaps I could be a writer as well. Pemabum, Wuser, Jamyang Nurbu, Tsering Thunduk, Tsering Wang Mudompa, Pemasetan, Kepchen Dedul, Takbum Gyal, Pemasewang Shastri, Tenzin Sundu, Pujung Di Sanam. These are our writers now. Their works fill our shelves, and their words echo our lives. Every now and then, I can catch a glimpse of myself or someone who looks very like me in the looking glass. It's not a small thing that these writers and filmmakers and artists and musicians have given us. It's only when art gives us entry into the lives of people like ourselves, with our loves and losses, our joys and sorrows, our hope and our despair, that we can begin to make sense of our own lives, to understand, to cherish, and to glory in our own humanity, to find divinity in it. These writers come from Tibet, China, India, Nepal, the United States, and Canada, and they write in multiple languages. They work in multiple genres. They write memoirs, novels, essays, poems. But whatever else they do, they also write short stories. Short stories have become one of the primary modern Tibetan art forms. But the non-Tibetan world is completely unaware that Tibetans even write short stories. 
So I like to think of this book as the coming out of the Tibetan short story. And coming outs are moments fraught with danger, power, and possibility. Through these sometimes absurd, sometimes strange, and always moving stories, the writers give the English reading audience a more authentic look at the lives of ordinary Tibetans navigating the space between tradition and modernity, occupation and exile, the national and the personal. For Tibetans, they do something a great deal more. They examine and explain our heartbreak, the heartbreak of our occupation, our exile, our diaspora. And in doing so, they give us comfort, clarity, and a measure of belonging. Thank you. Thank you, Dickie. Again, that was from the introduction to Old Demon's New Deities, which I strongly encourage you all to read. It really is a wonderful book. Our next reader is Rad Rahman, a 2017 Open City Muslim Community Fellow here at the workshop. She writes about Muslim and immigrant communities in New York City and state repression in Bangladesh. Rad's June 2017 op-ed in the New York Times, No Country for Bangladesh's Gay Men, follows the lack of justice for Zulhas Manan and Mahbub Rabi Tonoi, two prominent LGBT activists in Bangladesh who were murdered by terrorists in 2016. Rad has written about politics, human rights, and literature in Vice, The Guardian, The Paris Review, and more. In addition, she has consulted on communications with human rights groups such as I Pro Bono, UNICEF, and the International Center for Transnational Transitional Justice. Rad's first novel, Framed Butterflies, was published by Bard College Press in 2005, and she's currently working on another novel. Please welcome Rad Rahman. As many of you may remember, earlier this year, the US presidential inauguration crowd size created a media controversy. Donald Trump and the White House insisted that the tr crowds at Trump's inauguration were bigger than that of Obama's inauguration in 2009. Disputing visible evidence, Trump suggested that the fake news media was on a witch hunt to discredit his unparalleled popularity. Overnight, a renewed public interest in George Orwell's 1984 emerged across the United States. This decades-old work of speculative fiction served as a guide for understanding our current political moment, with readers sharing a very specific quote from the classic, where Orwell says, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. I find this quote significant as a frame of reference when we turn to examine the Burmese treatment of its minority Muslim Rohingya population. Orwell lived in the then called Burma for five years between 1920 and 1925, when he served as an officer for the British Imperial Police and still used his real name, Eric Arthur Blair. He lived along the Irrawaddy River in the north of the country in an area that today is not far from the Rakhine State, where the minority Muslim Rohingya population are currently being massacred in hundreds of, and thousands by the Bur Burmese military junta. When Orwell left his post abruptly in 1925, he was so shocked by the condition of local governance in the British Raj and the hierarchies in who was seen as a citizen or as a subject that he borrowed money from his aunt and changed his name so that he could write without being perceived as a source of embarrassment for his conservative British family. According to Emma Larkin, author of Finding George Orwell in Burma, local, locals consider the Orwellian classics 1984 Animal Farm, and Burmese Days to be a trilogy about Orwell's time in the country. If we are to take these books as exemplary of Burmese political realities, then we find clues as to what is presently happening in Myanmar, where Aung San Suu Kyi, Nobel Peace Laureate and the country's leader, recently failed to renounce what UN officials in Geneva have called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing by the country's military junta. A stark satellite an analysis by Human Rights Watch shows that at least 210 Rohingya villages have been burned to the ground since um, the military junta offensive began on August 25th. Since August, 600,000 Rohingya have fled into neighboring Bangladesh after being turned back from seeking asylum in India. 
Bangladeshi officials say landmines have been planted on Myanmar's side of the border, posing a threat to the fleeing Rohingya. According to UNICEF, over 60% of those who have crossed the Naaf River that separates Bangladesh and Burma are unaccompanied children. In Aung San Suu Kyi's much anticipated speech in addressing the crisis in mid-September, she steadfastly refused to criticize the country's military, which has been accused of a vast campaign of killing, rape, and village burning. Suu Kyi said, the security forces have been instructed to adhere strictly to the code of conduct in carrying out security operations to exercise all due restraint and to take full measures to avoid collateral damage and the harming of innocent civilians. Despite her claims, access to the Rakhine state has been heavily restricted to media, human rights groups, and diplomats. A tightly government-controlled media trip to Rakhine state was organized this September, but permits for journalists to visit the area independ independently and interview people without official interference has been next to impossible to come by. An official report commissioned by the government, by, by the gov Burmese government, and compiled by former UN Je General Secretary, Secretary General, sorry guys, <laughs> Kofi Annan, identified several key issues, including the lack of citizenship for stateless Rohingya Muslims, as well as socioeconomic challenges facing them, and police and military action in the state. The Burmese government has placed the blame on the fastest, of the fastest growing humanitarian crisis of 2017, squarely on the shoulders of the Rohingya themselves, in a complete rejection of what photographic, satellite, and narrative evidence suggests. The Suki regime is adamant, just like the White House today, about refuting facts and suggest, suggesting that fact-based news is liberal propaganda. Officials in the Burmese government have accused the Rohingya, who have su suffered decades of persecution, of faking rape and burning their own houses, in a bid to hijack international public opinion. Suki has done nothing to correct the record. The Burmese government, like its people, perceive the Rohingya as illegal Bangladeshi Muslims, alien to the land that they have lived on for centuries. Under the 1982 Myanmar nationality law, the Rohingya are denied citizenship. According to Human Rights Watch, the, 18, the 1982 laws effectively deny the Rohingya the possibility of acquiring a Burmese nationality. Despite being able to trace Rohingya history to the 8th century in Burma, Myanmar law does not recognize the ethnic minority as one of the eight national races. Over one million Rohingya lived in the Rakhine state as of August 25th, 2017. Meanwhile, 200,000 Rohingya arrived in Bangladesh in the past 34 years as refugees. Others have migrated to Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. But Bangladesh houses the highest percentage of displaced Rohingya. 85,000 Rohingya arrived between October 2016 and August 2017, driven out after military raids by the Rakhine Rohingya Salvation Army's increased altercations with the Burmese military junta. 127,000 were placed in internal displacement camps in the Rakhine state since 2012, and no Rohingya is allowed to receive work permits. The situation grew so bad that Rohingya left in open bo boats from the Rakhine state, amounting to hundreds of thousands during monsoon season just last year, for any country willing to, bound for any country willing to take them and to risk losing their lives in open seas instead of re remaining in Rakhine. Growing up in Chittagong, the Bangladeshi state that borders the Burmese Rakhine state, the idea of, idea of border crossings appeared normal. Myanmar, or what was then called Burma, was divided from Bengal's eastern borders by the British along religious lines in the late 19th century, without paying much attention to this local history of religious differences. The post-colonial residue of haphazard boundaries demarcating one's citizenship is not uncommon in South Asia, where the British Raj divided and ruled by pitting the local bourgeoisie against each other along ethnic and religious lines. The post-colonial governments of South Asia have adopted much of these colonial structures in their governance. Growing up, I remember family friends who proudly declared, we are Burmese Muslims. Now, however, these same friends' assertions appear in whispers. Once. During a family vacation, we went to Bangladesh's army headquarters in Teknaf, where 
we ate lunch in an officer's house. We learned how, right across the North River that separated us from Burma. You couldn't take any photographs. And that there was a nightly electricity curfew that started at 10 p.m., blackening the Rakhine state in complete darkness. Even later, while working with UNICEF, I conducted several qualitative in interviews in the largest refu refugee camp in Balukhali. Rohingya families refused to be filmed by our, fam uh, by our camera crew, ashamed of the liminal status in Bangladesh. Bangladesh's Rohingya crisis should be dubbed as a catastrophe because of Bangladesh's refusal to rehabilitate and integrate Rohingya into Bangladeshi society. Earlier this year, Bangladesh's government planned to send its Rohingya population to an island off the coast of the country, which is underwater for about 10 months of the year, due to rising water levels and flooding during monsoon. This plan was crapped when a hurricane wiped the low-lying island off the face of the map. That same hurricane leveled the largest of the refugee camps in Bangladesh to the ground, leaving many of the Rohingya devoid of even the mud huts and tarpaulin shelters for the oncoming monsoon. In fact, when the present crisis emerged, Bangladesh's Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina initially ordered the Rohingya to be fired at by the government's army at the Naf River so that they would turn back to the Rakhine state. The country's population, Bangladesh's population of 163 million, live in a, si a state the size of Wisconsin, on poverty levels affecting 31% living on less than $2 a day. The country routinely fails on all human rights indicators on managing sex trafficking, child marriage, nutrition, malnutrition, and child labor. It was only after the Turkish government offered substantial monetary help on September 4th that Bangladesh changed its position on the Rohingya crisis. This means that for 10 days, the Bangladeshi government fired at the new Rohingya entering the country, just like the Burmese counterpart. If Bangladesh is to take the crisis seriously, it should offer a chance of citizenship and therefore rights to those who have taken refuge in the state. More importantly, the government must provide clean water, health care, and food to those who have come in. In Balukali uh, refugee camp, Rohingya children jostled with adults to receive handouts from government trucks that throw aid packages at them. Just that threw aid packages at them this September. The Bangladeshi army has restricted access to local and international groups that want to provide aid for the Rohingya. Two died in a stampede for food in recent weeks. It is shocking to me that Bangladesh has not yet addressed the situation for over three decades, given that the US giving to Rohingya camps have amounted to 95 million alone, uh, this year alone, the highest of any foreign state. While Bangladesh can be lauded for accepting the Rohingya coming in, the question as to why the government is doing so remains unexamined. Bangladesh stands to gain from squandering the funds it receives as aid, earmarked for the Rohingya. The country already runs and exists on INGO interventions with little to non-existent functional government support of education, healthcare, or even birth registration. In the UNGA in New York City this September, Bangladesh's Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, addressed global leaders about the Rohingya. She said, these people must be able to return to their homeland in safety, security, and dignity. If the statement is to be taken at face value, there is no plan for Bangladesh to integrate the Rohingya refugees into Bangladeshi society. Bangladesh perse persecutes every single one of its minority populations. In the past few years, Hindu temples have been pillaged and burned across the country. Land grabbing of ethnic minorities in the Chittagong Hill tracts has accelerated, and locals in these areas have been denied education. Urdu-speaking communities have been harassed, as they tend to be, and Bangladesh turned a blind eye to writers, bloggers, and homosexuals being murdered by terrorists, refusing to acknowledge its growing extremism. In fact, in complete contrast to its secular platform, the con current Awa Awamali regime has aligned itself with Hifazat the Islam, an extremist outfit that plans to strip women of any working or inheritance rights and introduce the veil for every woman in the country. It was only when a popular upscale restaurant in Dhaka was attacked by ISIS affiliates in July last year, and 22 were killed, including American, Japanese, and Italian nationals, that Bangladesh took a stance to, in addressing its growing extremism. However, murders of dozens of bloggers and LGBT activists have still not been met with any form of justice, with only one arrest being made for these murders. 
And just last year alone, Bangladesh disappeared 13,000 in of its op opposition in a move that has been condemned globally. For all intents and purposes, it appears that the Hasina government is helping the Rohingya only because it helps her rebrand her own tarnished public image after international reportage around the dozens of high-profile journalists, activists, and minority group leaders being murdered have been reported. To see how blatantly Bangladesh, to see how blatantly Bangladesh is rebranding itself, one only needs to look at the banners that were plastered in English along the colonnades and overpasses that greeted travelers and tourists to Dhaka following the UNG me UNGA meeting in September when Hasina returned to Bangladesh, next to images of smiling Hasina and in English letters so that all foreigners with knowledge of English can understand, the banners called Hasina, mother of humanity. But if Bangladesh's decades old treatment of the Rohingya crisis is so far is any indication of what more is to come, Hasina's government is only showcasing a facade of humanitarian overtures before the country's next election but has no plan to create lasting infrastructure op opportunities to help the Rohingya. The last election was boycotted by the op opposition, and when citizens like I applied for a national identity card so I could vote, I was told 11 months after my application was filed that I never applied for an ID card. When all is said and done though, concrete plans to empower refugees to control their own lives and livelihoods have not been proposed by the Bangladeshi government on either the national or international stage. After all, just like the counterparts in Burma, Bangladesh's government firmly believes in what the authoritarian, authoritarian pigs in Orwell's animal farm suggest, that all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Thank you. Thank you, Raj, for that powerful account. Our third reader for tonight is Raisa Robles, a celebrated Filipina journalist and the author of Marcos Martial Law, Never Again, a brief history of torture and atrocity under the new society, which we are pleased to have on sale tonight. This book has been a critical success in the Philippines, where it remains taboo to speak about torture and atrocities under Marcos and the growth of authoritarianism under President Rodrigo Duarte. Published in 2016, Marcos Martial Law is a finalist in the Philippines' 2017 National Book Awards and the winner of the International Award for Excellence in Journalism. Raisa is the senior Manila correspondent of the South China Morning Post and the publisher of the investigative news blog of Philippine politics, RaisaRobles.com, which was judged Best Society and Politics blog in the Philippines in 2015. Rice's reportage has also been published in the Times of London, The Mail Online, BBC Radio, and Reuters. Raisa Robles, everyone. Uh, good evening. I'm very glad to be here with you tonight. Uh, this is a copy of my book, Marcos Martial Law Never Again, a short his a brief history of torture and atrocities under the new society. Truth is the first casualty of any leader who already has authoritarian tendencies or who wants to establish authoritarian rule. I believe this is the case of Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte, who despises alternative critical voices and dismisses and bashes them 
as destabilizers and or terrorists. Duterte's self-proclaimed idol, the dictator Ferdinand Marcos, whom he has buried in the Hero Cemetery, did the same over 40 years ago. When Marcos established what he called constitutional dictatorship, he tried to make sure his truth alone will be broadcast far and wide. So he shut down all media outlets, except those of his cronies and relatives. Today, Duterte seems to be copying from Marcos' playbook. One of the first untrue things that Marcos told the world after declaring martial law in 1972 was that no one but no one has been tortured by his regime. Later, after evidence surfaced to the contrary, he was forced to modify this sweeping statement to some were tortured, but these were isolated cases. In the years after he died, the post-Marcos governments unfortunately never made sure the truth about the Marcos dictatorship, the extrajudicial killings, illegal arrests and detentions, as well as massacres would be taught in schools nationwide. I won't go into the whys. I will merely say this stupendous vacuum of information allowed the Marcos family to plant lies and make post-Marcos generations believe that the Marcos dictatorship was the golden age of Philippine politics and authoritarian rule is great. And so, realizing this, I wrote this book with the help of a group of retired businessmen who banded together to form Filipinos for Better Philippines and published it. My husband, who was my book editor, and top multi-awarded awarded book designer, Felix Mago Miguel, helped me put the book together. The Philippines has never had a truth commission. And so I am hoping this book could break the silence on the torture and enable the Philippine military to understand what happens to their best and brightest during a dictatorship in the hope that military officers will never ever allow themselves to be used this way again by a charismatic Philippine leader. This was how the Marcos dictatorship started. First, with a charming leader who was adored and widely elected, then who violated the Philippine constitution in order to impose a dictatorship with the promise that it would lead to economic progress. Let me read to you now an excerpt from my book which presents the human side of torture from the eyes of the torture victim and from the accused torturer, now a retired colonel who allowed me to interview him. For brevity, I have modified and shortened the excerpt. Colonel Eduardo Matiliano was then a young lieutenant, fresh out of Philippine Military Academy. He was the lone senior officer who was actually court-martialed for human rights abuses. The victim in question was an urban poor leader named Trinidad Herrera from Tondo, the poorest section of the Philippine capital, Manila. Herrera had set up the Zone 1 Tondo Organization, or ZOTO, to fight for the rights of the residents to stay in their area and not be evicted by a crony of the dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, who wanted to use the land there for his business. On April 23, 1977, Herrera was arrested and brutally tortured. One of those she accused of torturing her was Colonel Matiliano, then a first lieutenant. The United States Embassy in Manila took a special interest in Herrera's arrest because she happened to have caught the attention of the U.S. First Lady, Rosalind Carter. In the year 2012, Herrera, by then 71 years old, narrated her ordeal to TV5 News Interaction. She said her interrogation lasted three to four hours. Her captors first wound two wires from a military field telephone around her thumbs. That's the US military field tele telephone that was used during the Second World War. She said when the, when the interrogators did not like her answer, they would turn the crank of the field telephone and the current would shoot through her body. She said the four men in the room, her interrogators, stripped her naked and made her stand barefoot on the ground on which they poured water to magnify the electric shock. So whenever the crank of the field telephone turned, she said, 
the current shot through her body. I kept screaming and screaming, even though no one would be coming to my rescue, she said. They kept asking me if I was a member of the Communist Party. I denied it and said I was the president of Zone 1 Tondo organization. They kept asking her whom she knew in the Communist movement. I told them I do not know anybody. Dissatisfied with her reply, her captors then transferred the wires to a part of her body that she couldn't bear to say on TV. She said, then uh, they transferred it, uh, you know, by her gestures on camera. She indicated that her interrogators had connected the wires to both her nipples. After what the military to this day calls her tactical interrogation, their euphemism for torture, Herrera said her speech was slurred for several days. She was released a week later when the American ambassador to Manila, Stephen Bosworth, personally visited her and handed her a letter from First Lady Rosalind Carter, urging her to be strong. Recalling her torture 35 years later, she said on national TV, I felt very much degraded, very much. I lost control of myself then. In 2015, Colonel Eduardo Matiliano allowed me to interview him. He was a graduate of the elite Philippine Military Academy where some of the best and brightest Filipinos went. By 2015, Colonel Matiliano was ash-haired but still lanky. After we sat down in a coffee shop where he sat facing the door, probably a habit acquired from intelligence work. However, the first thing he did was to bring out his wallet and show me pictures of his daughter, smiling and fresh out of law school. The thought that entered my mind, but did not share with him, was that years before, this very same man was accused of torturing other father's daughters to make them confess that they were communists and to force them to rat on fellow communists. Matiliano allowed me to record our conversation. He told me he regretted those days. We were used by the government. That's why we rebelled against President Marcos. We were going to launch a coup d'etat against him in 1986, he said. He declined to talk specifics about his activities as an interrogator, laughingly dismissing the subject, but did bring up one case. That case where I was tried by court-martial, what's her name? She was the president of Zone 1 Tondo organization. It was a subversive organization operating in Metro Manila, he told me. Was she subversive? I asked him. He replied, subversive, yes. We arrested her, then interrogated her. In the, process, in the process, they claimed there was torture. Was there torture? I softly asked him, afraid he might get mad at me. Colonel Matiliano laughed out loud at my blunt question, then fell silent. The silence felt like a wall between us. Then he broke the silence and said, I was tried for it but I was acquitted. They claimed that I, we electrocuted her. We would force her to talk about the organization and then she reported the human rights. I was charged with human rights violations. That's documented anyway. You can get that from the military archives. I tried getting that particular case from the military archives. And I was regretfully told by the archivist that the archives had burned down. During my interview with Colonel Matiliano, I was acutely aware that he could walk out on me anytime, get mad at me, and even threaten me. But I also sensed that he wanted to talk, to break the silence on his case. I asked him why he was singled out for court-martial when there were so many interrogators committing torture. I knew that was a loaded question I had asked. My question assumed that many interrogators were indeed committing torture. He replied, because the girl complained. I know to the Americans and to Amnesty International, the US government ordered the Philippine government to, you know. I asked him whether the torture had been ordered by Marcos. He said, it just happened. When I asked him to elaborate, he said, we were given so much power during martial law. For example, when I was assigned with the Metrocom Intelligence Security Group, the most powerful during martial law, we were the ones implementing the arrest 
search and seizure orders signed by the Defense Secretary Juan Ponce Enrile, he told me. He explained that under normal circumstances, those powers are hard to get. You have to go to court, file a request, present evidence. But under martial law, we were merely given a list and told these are the persons to be arrested. He chuckled and told me, we can even include the people who are not there. When I asked him whether he did that, he said he could not recall doing it, but added that some of his colleagues were doing that. He confirmed to me that the torture was happening on the ground was the exact opposite of what Marcos was claiming publicly then. Finally, I asked him, where does the torture come in, since the powers he mentioned of arrest, search, and seizure did not include torture? He replied, when I want to get information first, who are your companions, where are they, how do you, contact your, how do you conduct your activities? That's our, uh, that's our method of forcing him to talk, he said, because it's easier. You know, he casually told me, it's very tiring uh, to keep punching a person. Then he added that anyway, later, he considered himself as already, as already having been punished. In a way, when he was arrested and jailed for participating in a coup attempt against Marcos' successor, President Corazon Aquino. Right, now I'll invite all our readers to join me on the Jade Couch for the discussion portion of the evening. Now, how we're going to do the Q&A tonight in a bit is instead of having live questions from the audience, I will ask you when you think of a question any time from now onwards to raise your hand and someone will come to you with a piece of card and a pen and you can write your question on the card and it will be gathered up and brought to me. Oh, already, excellent. So, um, thank you for that wonderful series of readings, all of you. That was three really powerful accounts. Um, I want to start with a plug for a book that we had hoped to have present tonight, a Duterte reader, but we co-sponsored the launch at Columbia University over the last two days and sold out every copy we had. So, while I still recommend this, you'll have to wait for the American edition from Cornell University Press. I just want to read from Julio C. Tihanki's essay, um, Was Duterte's Rise Inevitable? Here's the opening. At the beginning of President Rodrigo Rodi Duterte's term in 2016, it was hoped that the institution of the presidency would change him. Yet after his first year in power, it has become apparent that it was Duterte who was changing the presidency. Through his controversial actions, such as the deadly war on drugs, the hero's burial for the ousted dictator Ferdinand Marcos, and the reimposition of the death penalty, one can surmise that he is repudiating the reformist, albeit elitist, narrative of the liberal democratic regime established three decades ago with the ouster of the Marcos dictatorship. So Raisa, could you pick up from there? Do you agree with this account that there has been three decades of progress? How much has there actually been? And are all those gains now being wiped out? Is this working? Okay. Um, I would, okay, I will preface my, quest, my answer with this. The Marcoses have always uh, put forth in the social media and also the Duterte supporters that there has been no progress at all since 1986 when the Marcoses were ousted. But I beg to disagree. When the Marcoses were ousted, uh, the, the poverty rate in, in the Philippines was over 50%. And right now, the poverty rate is around uh, one for 20 about 26%. So there's a drop in poverty rate. But personally, I feel that that is not enough. That there should be more, 
you know, uh, there should be mo more effort on the part of the, of the government and on the part of the businessmen to give the gains of democracy, especially to the poor. Um, Duterte is a phenomenon, but I believe that that part, uh, you know, the reason why he also rose was that uh, the other politicians were very sneaky. Um, the Marcoses um, uh, supported him. The former disgraced, two former disgraced presidents, Joseph Estrada, Gloria Arroyo, also supported him, you know. And um, he had a lot of political support, and he was able to game social media for the first time. Remember, social media is a very recent phenomenon, especially in the political arena. He was able to game it because whenever somebody, uh, you know, uh, expressed contrary opinion, he was bashed uh, to a very great degree. Uh, and that's what happened. I think that that uh, contributed. Also, uh, because because the the gains of democracy were not felt by the lower class, and even the middle class was uh, was unhappy with it. I think that's where the uh, the support for Duterte came. And speaking about gaming social media, I want to turn to Dickie. Um, you spoke about literary orphanage and the people of Tibet lacking a voice. Has social media in any way ameliorated this, or is the tight control from the Chinese government an impediment there? So the control from um, the control by the Chinese state on what Tibetans are writing, what they're reading, it is very tight control. Uh, uh, it is a very restricted space, but social media has. Uh, given Tibetans a way to communicate with each other, a way to um, often navigate uh, the various forms of control that are being exercised. Uh, I'm sure many of you here probably know about uh, WeChat, which is, um, I mean, Tibetans, you know, on both sides of the Himalayas are using it enormously to, to connect with each other. Uh, but even obviously, I mean, something like WeChat especially, it is monitored by the Chinese state. Uh, so there are often, I mean, there are ways that people will often um, use, uh, there, will, there are terms that people use to, uh, you know, talk about certain things. Uh, so I would say social media has been a, um, an enormous blessing. Uh, and I mean, it's not just the internet in general has been an enormous blessing for, uh, for Tibetans, um, allowing them to communicate in a way that is completely unprecedented because especially since, um, uh, well, since, the Cultural Revolution, since the end of the Cultural Revolution, when sort of this new flowering of Tibetan literature uh, began, and you know we began to see new writers, we began to see new poems, new short stories, novels. Um, there has been an enormous uh, amount of activity, but it's often very hard for Tibetans inside Tibet to communicate with Tibetans outside Tibet. Um, there are people who will, you know, it used to be people literally just sort of walked across the mountains into exile. Um, but especially since uh, the sort of massive protests in 2008 that completely overtook the plateau and Tibetans, you know, all over Tibet sort of uh, rose up in an unprecedented protest. In 2008, since then, uh, the, gov the Chinese government has really sort of locked down and stopped. Uh, I mean, even before, you know, it's very dangerous for Tibetans to attempt to cross over into exile. But especially since then, uh, it has become extremely, extremely restricted. So, so now, uh, it is with the internet that people are able to communicate. And uh, I mean, I would say it's still, it's still a very um, restricted space. People have to be careful. There are uh, people who have gotten into trouble. There are people who have been jailed. Um, 
for, for you know, calling people outside to give them news and updates and that sort of thing. Uh, but, but it has uh, been very important for Tibetans. Um, right, so the sharing of information is power in a way, which is why governments crack down on it. And so the internet is a force that fosters that. It can also be dangerous and or restricted. Um, Rad, you said that Bangladesh persecutes every one of its minority populations. Um, has there been any solidarity between these populations, including through the sharing of information? I think as a collective, uh, no. I mean, uh, people in different marginalized groups have reached out to the international community and worked with them to voice their concerns, but even if it's uh, between bloggers and the LGBT community, there has been very little solidarity and or uh, with ethnic minorities who live in the Chittagong Hill Tracts and other groups, there hasn't really been much um, in terms of like coming together to express concern about um, how they're being treated. Uh, it's very individualized, I think, as these different groups are able to express themselves. Great. Now, a general question for all three of you, and really the central question of this evening, which is, what can we do with these contested histories if there is a literal denial of the facts of the past, if there are archives that burn down? What can we do to know what's actually happening, and how can we resist if the facts themselves are so hard to establish? Just to throw you in the deep end. <laughs> Would anyone like to? Um, I mean, I think one thing that is actually, that we must do all the time is um, remember, remember history, which sounds so obvious and stupid to say, but, um, but there's so many, I mean, there's, there's so many people who sort of try to restrict history and who try to pretend um, that what happened was something else than what really happened. And I think uh, we just have to educate ourselves. Uh, we have to remember. Uh, we have to, to insist upon upon history as it happened. Um, and I think we just, we have to be vigilant and uh, we have to be brave and call out lies when we see lies. Um, even if it's, you know, it means that you're not gonna get a visa to China or it means that it's politically incorrect or, um, you know, someone, or, or it seems obvious. Um, I mean, just me, per there's so many times when I read articles uh, in the news that, that sort of talk about Tibet as if, oh, it's always been a part of China. No, um, it was invaded in 1949. Uh, Mao sent his army, um, the PLA killed, you know, tens of thousands of people. There was, uh, there was a massive ma massacre. Uh, Tibetans uh, rose up in, uh, Tibetans fought, the Tibetan army fought, was totally decimated. Um, it, it was an invasion, uh, what happened. And I mean, not just Tibet, so many times in history, uh, things happen and, and now, you know, they were one way and now it is another way. But that doesn't mean that it's right. That doesn't mean that we sit back and, and don't call out on it. And that's, I mean, one very small thing that we can do every day in our lives. Yes, the need to import and the, remember the past and not let lies proliferate. Um, Raisa, could you talk a bit about your book, which is a capturing of the past as well as a linking of that past to the present? Yes. Um, in connection also with your, your uh, 
question, the general question. We have to fight to remember the real history um, of what had happened because uh, the, the powers that be are trying to propose an alternative, a revised history. So um, the, the way to remember is to be able to, to, to find the truth. And what is the truth? You know, uh, this book was in a way difficult to do, but also easier to do at this point in time. Because fortunately, I could counter check what, was, uh, what took place then through the archives of international organizations. Uh, for instance, to find out what exactly, what happened, you know, uh, between Mar uh, when Marcos was about to impose martial law, I was able to, f to look at the declassified Central Intelligence Agency uh, reports. Um, and then I was al also able to, to uh, look at the declassified Department of State uh, cables, uh, collection of cables to and from Manila. And I think that tremendously helped. Because, because I was uh, living in that period, although I was very young, I could sense whether uh, an, what an American cable, a U.S. embassy cable was saying, um, if it was a matter of fact or if it, it was a matter of opinion. Uh, I could discern the two. But if it was a matter of fact, then uh, at least I get a lead and then I go to, to my sources uh, to ask whether this really happened. Oh, it was also fortunate that it was at this point in time that some of the military men were, a, were, were uh, ready to talk about that period. One, um, one colonel, uh, not Colonel Matiliano, one other colonel that I interviewed, um, I always try to bargain, you know, with, my, with those that I interview. If they cannot be, at, uh, if their quotes cannot be attributed, then at least it is uh, not for attribution. But then in this case, he told me, I can name him after he dies, but he's, not, he's still alive, so I cannot name him. He belonged to the, uh, the, the main spy agency of Ferdinand Marcos, and he was able to tell me a lot, you know, how Marcos, you know, uh, took steps to impose martial law. How he, uh, how he set up, he, he himself was told to set up inside a military camp just outside Manila, a very large detention center. You know, um, military camps do not have big detention centers. It was only Marcos who set up so many detention camps around the country. Uh, and, and he jailed, he's the first president to jail so many of his fellow men for dissenting against him. Okay, one other thing uh, uh, that helped me, Amnesty International put up so much of its archives online, and I'm sure that they have online, you know, their reports on Tibet, you know, or on, on, on other countries. I'm sure you can tap them. World Council of Churches also did that. International Commission of Ju Juries also did that. So uh, I found a rich load of, of data. So because I knew that, then I could go to the uh, accused torturers. Uh, one is a general. I could, you know, I could argue with him because the, the problem with, with, with uh, interviewing people blind, you do not know, uh, you know, you don't know s a lot of the data, is you would go by their word. But because I had read so much of the reports, I was able to, to ask them uh, very specific questions about what had happened, uh, especially where they were involved. Another uh, rich load of, of information is the reports of the U.S. Congress. Uh, I was able to find, uh, for instance, a, a report on the, on the insurgency that was happening here, authored by Larry Nix. Larry Nix is now a U.S. Congress, uh, I think he's part of the staff, but he is an anti-terrorist expert. But before that, he, had, he was the only, he was the lone uh, American official who was allowed 
to visit the different military camps uh, across the country uh, because uh, for the ostensible reason that the U.S. Congress needed, you know, Richard Lugar needed uh, more data so that uh, they could, uh, you know, they could decide how much uh, money to give to Marcos. That was the only reason that, that he was allowed to go all across the country. But his report was, very, was an eye-opener. So I would encourage, you know, uh, it's like, what you said about uh, I was struck by by your uh, what you said about uh, you deny them their own reflection. Uh, who was you said that something about denying their own reflection? There must be reflections of what was happening in your country somewhere outside your country, and you've got to look for them. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from the audience, and that last point ties nicely into this one for Dicky. Where can someone find a non-biased history of Tibet? Where does the general information come from? Is it from a Chinese perspective or any other foreign perspective? And also, who has been telling Tibetan stories before this flowering of Tibetan literature? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, I would say there, ha there are translations of um, Tibetan history books from, you know, uh, one of the old, old uh, histories um, is written by this guy, Go Lozawa Shinupel. This is hundreds of years old. There's a translation in English. Um, you could go and read that book. Uh, there are, <laughs> there's the International Dunhuang Project, um, which, so Dunhuang is uh, a cave in um, present-day China, and it was discovered uh, maybe turn of the century, um, and manuscripts from that cave uh, are now we know some of the earliest Tibetan written records. Um, so, I mean, there is material dating from there. But I would, okay, so, I mean, that goes into very historical stuff. Uh, but if you want some books to read, I would say, um, well, Patrick French's book on Tibet is, is um, actually sort of beautiful. Um, you could read uh, the, you could read the Dalai Lama's uh, autobiography, which is his own personal story of what happened to him and his country. Uh, there are many books written by academics. Um, I mean, one book I would recommend uh, would be Gray Tuttle's book, or um, Simon, Sam Van Schaik, his uh, Tibet a History is like a brilliant read and also just a great book. Uh, so that was, okay, the reads on Tibet was one thing. What was the second um, part of that question? Who has been telling Tibetan stories before this flowering of Tibetan literature? Tibetan literature is, I mean, it's one of the oldest literary canons in the world, uh, but the majority of Tibetan writing thus far has been about religion. So um, the majority of Tibetan religion, um, Tibetan literature is Buddhist literature. So there has, I mean, um, you know, on a per capita uh, basis probably, there, it, like the amount of literature that Tibetans have produced is enormous. Um, but it was really only in beginning in the 80s, really 1980, 1981, when the first Tibetan literary journals were established. And um, a couple of years before that, when Tundub Gyal, uh, who's sort of considered the father of modern Tibetan literature, began writing. Uh, that's when, you know, uh, that's when uh, 
modern Tibetan literature is considered to have begun. So before that, people were writing um, more traditional texts. One of the primary Tibetan literary genres is really, it's, it's like the genre of the hagiography. So a lot of Tibetans, and also actually a lot of Indians who came to Tibet to teach, uh, to teach Buddhist texts. So a lot of them wrote hagiographies, lives of these saints. Um, you know, how someone lives, how, uh, what, what sutras they studied, how they supposedly became enlightened, like all of, all of um, those, all of that sort of genre of stories. And now, much more recently, um, people have begun writing. N now there are more uh, non-hagiography, but more biographical um, life stories. So there is, uh, Re more recently, I mean, there's a few sort of Tibetan memoirs of the Cultural Revolution. There's other uh, Tibetan memoirs of, you know, people who have um, suffered, and, uh, who people who have come out and written about life under Chinese rule. Uh, there are people who have written about um, their, their memoirs of sort of escape and exile. Uh, so there is, there, there are a lot of books out there. You just have to Google and find them. Thank you. That's, it's heartening that there are more Tibetan voices out there, and I encourage everyone to search them out. Next, a general question. Dictators claim that Asian values make autocracy integral for economic growth and political stability. How do we as artists fight this claim? You know, that was one of the books that Marcos wrote uh, during martial law. He argued, that was one of his ideologies, he argued that a third, world a third world country in order to progress needs uh, authoritarianism, you know, uh, because uh, a leader, uh, he didn't say like him, but he just said a leader uh, is needed to be able to, you know, to, to lead his people into um, economic growth. But, you know, just show what, what happened to the Marcos dictatorship. Uh, when he fled in 1986, uh, the economy was really down. And then uh, he, he borrowed so much money, and a lot of that money went to waste, or went to his cronies, or went to his pocket. It, uh, there is a specific you know, uh, Swiss, uh, federal Supreme Court ruling on his Swiss bank accounts, that they are of criminal origin. So when you ask that question, the, the, the case of Ferdinand Marcos is a very good case to show that that is not true. And it's all in my book. Um, I think to have um, artistic uh, creativity in, in a time period where there is a lot of um, fake news proliferating everywhere. Um, you do have to uh, read the real accounts um, by news outlets that are um, reputable. And um, I mean, I'm working on, on a novel right now which talks about rising uh, extremism and bondage. And um, what I found was even reading accounts in Bengali newspapers that are reputable um, doesn't serve me because a lot of them have agendas and every piece of writing is political um, wherever it's published. So, I mean, I went back and I started looking at accounts um, in library books um, and um, whether it was the New York Times or, or other outlets that have reported on bondage extremism, I found them to be much more helpful um, than accounts even by my own government or accounts written by the Burmese government um, about the Japanese invasion, say, of, uh, of uh, World War II in Burma. And um, I mean, for me, it's really fascinating because I think a lot of creativity rests on grounding yourself in that kind of reality um, of um, real news <laughs> and, and then like taking off to whatever ends your work um, needs for you to go. And um, in my personal experience, 
I had to come to the U.S. to find out more about South Asian history, which, which is kind of shocking that I learned more in a college in upstate New York than I have in 18 years of living in South Asia because it was just so politicized and so much of it has been erased. Um, I mean, freedom is a universal value. Uh, Asians are no more or no less entitled to freedom and to um, taking charge of our own destinies than any other people. Um, one of the great freedom struggles of all time is, I mean, look at India, right? The Indian freedom struggle against the British. Um, so it's just ridiculous to me that, um, I mean, recently, maybe some of you guys saw in the news, um, there's now uh, Xi Jinping thought, you know, with so socialist characteristics. It, it's so silly. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's just, uh, we should just keep in mind that uh, the Chinese government is sort of, I mean, it's now one of the great colonial powers of the world. Um, and it is a dictatorship. Uh, it's now, you know, maybe just past 60. Uh, dictatorships and authoritarian regimes do tend to have an expiration date. At some point, people refuse, refuse authoritarian rule. Um, I, I think we just have to remember that history is always changing and um, that dictatorships don't last forever. Um, which brings us to this question for Raisa. How do we situate these authoritarian regimes, Marcos and Duterte, within a larger framework of Euro-American colonialism and imperialism, which is not to discount the rights violations of either regime, but rather to call into question the rise of authoritarianism as a symmetrical reaction? First of all, I believe that Duterte is using uh, American colonialist atrocities uh, to get back at the U.S. and uh, you know f because uh, it is it has been criticizing him on his war on drugs, but it's very interesting that he doesn't talk about Japanese atrocities in the Philippines. He has never brought it up with a prime minister and their buddy buddies. They all even go like that, you know. <laughs> Uh, so he's very picky when it comes to history. Uh, but let me tell you something about my country. My country is the only American colony in Asia, which makes us very strange to the rest of the neighbors, uh, because they think that uh, the Filipi Filipinos love the U.S. very much. Well, it's true. Surveys say, uh, show that it's true. But the reason is that it was only the Americans not the Spaniards who, who also colonized us, who brought education, the, the American brand of education. And education is also a two-headed sword, you know? Uh, because of our education, we learned also to criticize the Americans, which we have been doing. But Duterte is the first Philippine president to criticize in their faces the Americans. And the president then, Barack Obama, did not even flinch, did not even threaten, which is very, very interesting. I don't know if that is good for the U.S. Uh, I mean, a, a good example for the U.S., for the rest of the world, that uh, now you can actually, you know, say bad words and cast the U.S. president and there will be no consequences. Okay, going back, uh, we were, okay, we were colonized by the Spaniards before, uh, 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 but you know they never they never tried to help the Filipinos. We were just a a place for digging out all the resources and sending them, them back to Mexico and 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 Spain. Uh, that was all. So there was no love lost between the Philippines, the Fili most Filipinos and the Spaniards. Uh, but apparently the Americans were able to you know to to establish some sort of bond with Filipinos. So that is our situation today. But now, you know that President Duterte is inching towards China. But let me tell you about China and the Philippines. Uh, the Filip Filipinos never had a ne 
had a big quarrel with, with the Chinese, with China, uh, or the Chinese government. It is only now that we're having a quarrel over the West Philippine Sea. That's all. Thank you. Now, we're running short of time, so I'm going to take the last two questions together, and then we'll close out the evening. The first question is, is there an example in South African post-apartheid that might be possible for preserving the memory of what really happened and achieving reconciliation? The second question, which seems like an appropriate one to end on, is Americans are now getting a taste, some for the first time, of what things could be like in an authoritarian regime. How are your perspectives on what is shifting in the US right now? I'm not sure if it's the US right now or the US right now. Um, <laughs> shaped by your direct knowledge and experience of truly authoritarian regimes. Question. What was the first question? Um, truth and reconciliation. One thing that Nelson Mandela had that we haven't had is the Truth Commission. And I wish we could still have the Truth Commission. Uh, and, well, uh, Marcos actually uh, championed apartheid during that time. So we're still hoping. And the second one about uh, y you're having a problem with Trump. Uh, you know, I cannot, I cannot imagine, I cannot, my mind cannot grasp that too much because of, uh, of my experience with authoritarian regimes. But then my friends here say that he's becoming authoritarian. Uh, but, you know, the United States has had a longer history than us, and you've had a civil war. We haven't had a civil war, and they're threatening, one, you know, if Duterte is ever uh, ousted. So I, the, the one thing that you do have is that you have a corrective mechanism. And even the, 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 uh, his own party mates, your president's own party mates, are, are quarreling with him. In my country, the party mates of President Duterte, they're all with him, and you do not see a, an opposing voice, uh, critical, uh, within the same party. Uh, but we are looking very fascinatedly at what is happening to you because now uh, there are talks about impeaching your own president and we're thinking, hmm, I will stop there. Anyone else want to jump in? Um, as far as uh, truth and reconciliation commissions go with South Africa, what I find fascinating is that for South Africans, it didn't white workout as much as um, it was anticipated to be working out. Um, I had the honor of working with Alex Borain, who led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa while I was working at the International Center for Transitional Justice. And um, what I learned from it, that, that whole experience for two years, was that, I mean, to have any kind of transitional justice, firstly, you have to admit that there is a problem. And, um, and there are very many facets to it, whether it's gender justice or, or reconciling child soldiers, um, security sector reform, um, and, and, um, or even having um, uh, ways of recompens recompensating people who have been affected by, um, by um, apartheid regimes. So, um, to have reparations programming. And in all of these countries um, that are expressing authoritarian regimes, there hasn't quite been um, an acknowledgement of the actual problem. As far as uh, Bangladesh is concerned, for example, um, I remember my company was uh, hired to have a uh, like um, to give legal counsel for inter international criminal court that would try uh, people who were uh, committing atrocities during the 1971 war of independence. Um, the Bangladeshi government didn't take any of our recommendations and we actually had to go on record to say that we did not support their tactics in the witch hunt that resulted in Bangladesh in 2012 while Bangladesh's government 
was conducting a witch hunt for people who um, they claimed had um, committed atrocities during the War of Independence. I mean, all this to say that eventually it became a much more widespread problem that led to extremism in Bangladesh because several of the opposition party leaders were executed um, in, um, in courts of law that uh, didn't follow or adhere to any kind of international regulations or transparent uh, reporting uh, about what was going on. So I personally find that certainly, like having worked in a transitional justice organization for two years, it's a great ideal, but as far as uh, it exists in reality, Bangladesh, Burma, these countries are not prepared to admit um, the atrocities that it has committed upon its own people. Um, like, and the truth is that every side kills in a war, in any atrocity. And this is completely paved over even in the history of um, how Bangladesh has uh, spoken about its uh, founding as a nation. Um, all minorities' voices are stamped out, and that is a problem. Um, I would love to see a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for, you know, Tibet and China and East oh. Turkestan. Um, and, and, I mean, that would be a dream um, and a hope. Um, and it's not impossible. Um, as far as Trump and America is concerned, I think a lot of us thought so, or you know, at least, I mean, there were people who said America is post-race, it's post-racism. Uh, it is, you know, like it was this beautiful new world and no, 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 um, Trump became president. Uh, and of course, I mean, for many of us, uh, we knew, uh, we, uh, we, I mean, that was our reality, right? Um, so I think one thing that I see that is actually very hopeful is I see a lot of people out on the streets. I see a lot of people um, much more engaged in politics um, and in, in truth and justice and in doing what we as you know, everyday citizens can do uh, because we can't just sit back and, and um, let powerful, unjust people do whatever they want. Uh, we have to act. But why, why are we here otherwise? Uh, we have to do what we can while while we're here and um, and make, I guess, our like brief time on this planet meaningful. Uh, so, so that it, that actually is uh, when I see people acting, when I see people more engaged in politics and you know in their local um, community, in in governance, in um, in whatever small way that they can uh, have an impact, uh, it's hopeful. And uh, I think we always have to, have to have hope that we can make change. And uh, we have to work and make sure that Trump is, well, either impeached or, or, <laughs> or um, in the White House for four years and not longer. I think the key with Trump is to remain angry. And as long as you remain angry, you're going to go out into the streets and do things um, to protest him. And that's what is needed to create change. And I think we'll end on that call to arms. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been an event of the Trans-Pacific Literary Project. And I encourage you to check out our posts on the margins. The Trans-Pacific Literary Project is a platform for writing from East and Southeast Asia. Please go onto our website where, in the margins, you can continue this conversation. You can also literally continue this conversation by sticking around and, in a more informal setting, continuing. Um, our panelists will be happy to sign books, which are, once again, available for purchase. 
And thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Raisa Robles, Tenson Dickey, and Rod Rahman.